All right. Welcome everyone that's joining us. We're going to get started in a couple minutes. Today you're joining a webinar of the Ocean Acidification Science Task Force. This is Integrated Modeling of Ocean Acidification Hypoxia, Supporting Ecosystem Prediction and Environmental Management in the California Current. We're going to get started shortly. Stay tuned. I'm going to put myself on mute for a few minutes, um, but we're starting at 10. So thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to get started shortly. Stay tuned. We're starting at 10. We have a minute or so left. Um, you're joining the Ocean Certification and Hypoxia Science Task Force webinar. We're going to get started shortly. Stay tuned. All right, thank you everyone for joining today. We're gonna to get started. You are joining the Integrated Modeling of Ocean Acidification Hypoxia, Supporting Ecosystem Predictions and Environmental Management in the California Current. Today, I am going to be your host and moderator. Uh, I'm, my name is Haley Carter. I'm a Senior Science Officer at the California Ocean Science Trust, and I'll be moderating this webinar on behalf, behalf of the California Ocean Acidification Hypoxia Science Task Force. Uh, just to note that we are going to be recording this. So let me start the recording. Oh, recording it? Perfect. We're already recording it. So we're scheduled for two hours today from 10 a.m. to noon. And so, yep, stay tuned for that. One second. Uh, so public participants, you are logged in in listen-only mode. Our panelists, we have four speakers today. You're, please, I ask you to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Otherwise, uh, we have the ability to mute and unmute folks on our end. I ask speakers to keep to the time allotment. We have a packed agenda today. Uh, we're going to save all questions until the end. And there are two ways that you can ask questions or provide comments. So I think it's going to be easier if you chat in your questions to us as the host or send those to the panelists, we can all see them. Or during the, the question and comment period, you can raise your hand using the raise your hand function, I believe. And we can call on you if you have your audio linked that you can speak up. If you're on your phone line, you can press star six. Um, otherwise, chat in your questions at any time during any of the presentations. First off, though, before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge the a uh, tragedy that happened in Southern California, the fire boat, the, the sorry, I'm, it hit really close to home. Um, there was a tragedy in Southern California on a dive boat and some of our close um, colleagues um, were affected. So our heart and condolences go out to them. Um, so I appreciate uh, your patience with me. So a, a bit about these webinars. Um, the OAH Science Task Force is a science advisory group to the California Ocean Protection Council. It was convened in 2008 in response to recommendations of the West Coast Ocean Acidification Hypoxia Science Panel, as well as Assembly Bill 2139, which was passed in 2016. The task force is co-chaired by Steve Weisberg from the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project and Francis Chan from Oregon State University. You can learn more about the task force at www.westcoastoah.org. And the purpose of these webinars is to track scientific efforts 
um, that are funded by the Ocean Protection Council in order to coordinate across the West Coast region and beyond to maximize state investments and provide a forum for engagement and dialogue between scientists and decision makers. This webinar is a follow-up to a webinar we hosted about a year ago um, titled Supporting Development of Ocean Acidification and Water Quality Thresholds in California. And this is going to be an update on that. Last year, we had the water boards attending, the California State Water Resources Control Board, chatting about how they can use this information in a regulatory context. Um, so just a bit about today's audience. It's largely state and federal government. We have some nonprofit sector folks and industry, um, and also research science and academia. So just wanted to give you a breakdown of who we expect on this webinar today. And so just a bit about this modeling effort. Um, Ocean Protection Council and NOAA invested in this integrated Earth Systems model in 2013 to support conversations about California's response to climate change and changing ocean conditions, including multiple stressor effects of ocean acidification, hypoxia, and temperature. The goal was to characterize the magnitude, frequency, extent of these multi-stressors within the California current ecosystem now and that are future scenarios with climate change and to start to tease apart drivers along our coast. Since we can't monitor everywhere at all times, modeling can help fill in our understanding of exposure of these changing ocean conditions to marine life and inform our mitigation and adaptation strategies. The State of California's Ocean Acidification Action Plan released in 2018 called out local pollution management as a possible response. The State of California is debating development of OA water quality criteria objectives and whether we should be implementing controls on nutrients which have the potential to exacerbate ocean acidification and hypoxia along the coast. This work can help inform when, where, and how much we're seeing an impact from local anthropogenic inputs, providing critical information for management agencies to determine the appropriate course of action. This work has been underway for six years and is a collaboration of multiple PIs and many institutions, some of which you'll hear from today. So today you're gonna to hear a series of 10 to 25 minute presentations that will report out on the modeling progress to date and how model outputs are already being leveraged. We'll hear from four speakers who are going to provide an overview of the model and validation efforts, an update on, project, on the project intended to help develop species vulnerability thresholds for calcifying marine organisms, thoughts on how these thresholds might be used in a non-regulatory decision-making context, and perspectives on the steps needed to translate thresholds into a regulatory framework. So first off, we're gonna hear from Jim McWilliams from UCLA Department of Earth and Atmospheric Science. Jim has a PhD in applied mathematics from Harvard and specializes in the theory and computational modeling of fluid dynamics of Earth's oceans and atmosphere. He's currently a professor at UCLA. He will be giving an overview of the modeling program reanalysis, simulation, and validation, climate change, eutrophication, hypoxia, acidification, and habitat constraints along the U.S. West Coast. Next, you're gonna hear from Curtis Deutsch from University of Washington School of Oceanography. Curtis is an associate professor at the University of Washington School of Oceanography. He specializes in understanding interactions between climate and ecosystems by combining numerical models with physical and biological data. Today, he will speak to implications of climate change on aerobic fish habitat and the California current system. And then next, we have Faisal Kassori. Faisal has a PhD in oceanography from the University of Toulouse, Paul Sabatier, and specializes in physical biochemical ocean modeling. He presently works as a senior scientist for the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project in Costa Mesa and is a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences at UCLA. Faisal will speak to investigations of effects on local anthropogenic nutrient inputs on acidification and hypoxia in the Southern California Bight. And then lastly, you'll hear from Daniele Bianchi. Daniele is an oceanographer and an assistant professor at UCLA. His research focuses on the interactions between ocean physics, chemistry, and marine life, which he studies by using a combination of data synthesis and numerical models. Today, he will present on leveraging a California current system OAH modeling for future applications, nitrogen cycles, fisheries, productivity, and harmful algal bloom modeling. So with that, a reminder to chat in your questions. If you have questions at any time, questions or comments, we're gonna take questions all at the end after all presentations, but you can chat in a question using the chat box and or use the raise your hand function and we can try and call on you using audio. You have to have your audio linked, um, but I recommend using the chat function. I think it'll be more efficient. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna turn it over to you, Jim, to share your screen. <laughs> 
Do we have audio from Jim? Do you? Yep, perfect. All right, we'll take it away. Okay, um, good morning. Um, everyone can see my screen? I hope. Um, yep. The introduction was largely just made by Haley. Um, this is reporting on a, a cooperative project and by a number of people, uh, particularly focusing on the modeling in the part I'll talk, to by, talk about today. Um, in the parts I'm involved in, it's been sponsored by NOAA and the California Ocean Protection Council, as well as the National Science Foundation. And it's based on modeling that we've undertaken with a particular physical circulation model called ROMS and a particular uh, biogeochemical and lower trophic ecosystem model called BEC. And in order to carry out the, the kinds of calculations we were doing, there's coupling to the an atmospheric model, WARF, and to a surface wave model, although the surface wave work is, is, is more prospective than, than completed. Um, the general context, which I'm sure most of you know, is that the oceans are warming and losing oxygen and um, gaining acidity. And these have significant ecosystem contexts um, and the ecosystem uh, perturbations are enhanced by fishing and other habitat disruptions. The particular figure at the bottom here is a depiction of two ways that ocean uh, oxygen is being depleted, or at least two locations. Um, one is referring to the interior oxygen minimum zones, um, where essentially it, it's the interior respiration from surface layer productivity that is carried into the interior. And these zones are shallowing and expanding in volume. Um, and coastal dead zones where uh, eutrophication from anthropogenic nutrients is the primary um, cause of the problem. Um, the focus here in this project is on eastern boundary upwelling systems, the California Current, uh, which is a particularly productive region that is highly vulnerable to low oxygen and low pH waters, essentially because the, the deep ocean comes closer to the surface through wind-driven upwelling. Um, and therefore, it's a place where these problems are likely to be particularly bad. And it's a, essentially a phenomena that is the intersection of, of three influences, the large-scale global acidification and deoxygenation the natural climate variability that, that causes fluctuations in, in these behaviors, and then the local anthropogenic pollution of coastal waters, essentially from wastewater discharges, agricultural runoff, and atmospheric pollution deposition. An early identification of the acidification problem in the California current uh, was done by Gruber. This is from a paper in 2012 in which um, with a certain scenario of increasing carbon pollution in, in the world, um, here are cross sections associated with nominal dates of the aragonite saturation state, symbol omega, um, with the coast on the right and the upward tilt of the isolines associated with upwelling. And omega is something that, that measures the degree of, of of danger for calcium carbonate in shells and, and other organismic impacts. And in particular, omega equal one is often taken as a, a, a threshold of danger, although of course there's a continuum of impacts. As you see, there's a strong rising of this omega equals one threshold with time um, under global change, predicting that corrosive waters will come much closer to the surface and impact a much larger volume of the ecosystem. The model context is one that is um, built on, oh, well, the, the duration of this project, but 
built on top of prior periods of, of learning how to make regional equilibrium realistic um, simulation models in, in the ocean, both physical and, and biogeochemical. Um, and in the course of, of doing this project, a, a number of, of new issues arose. There's a short list of them here, which I won't talk my way through. Mostly they have at this point been published as, as particular studies of, of model design and consequences. And um, further developments are underway for additional processes. The work was initiated to look at the impacts of acidification and, and hypoxia on the West Coast, but it has expanded considerably beyond that to look at a number of other issues that essentially depend on the backbone model simulations. So the technique that we use um, is one that involves regional to local grid nesting. In this picture is a sketch of boundaries um, of a larger US West Coast model um, done at what would be considered high mesoscale eddy resolution. And you see an instantaneous snapshot in, in the simulations on a particular date of the sea surface temperature showing the cold water near the coast and the broad general pattern of, of the interior gyres. Um, the other boxes indicate nested subdomains in which higher resolution calculations can be made, but still under the impact through the boundary conditions from the, the coarser parent simulation of the larger scale influences. And this in an area around the, the Santa Barbara here depicts a, a, a four level step down um, to uh, very high local resolution. And this sort of technique is deployed in various ways depending on the question being asked. The backbone calculations have, have been a, a set of reanalysis simulations in which the regional model is, is forced with downscaling of global atmospheric and oceanic simulations with an intervening downscaling of the atmospheric simulation of the wharf. The standard resolution has a horizontal grid of four kilometers. And we initially did a period 1995 to 2010, because that's when we had the available global data. We're in the process of extending it to 2017. Now, um, much of the purpose of this, besides providing background fields for, for finer scale nesting for more local questions, was to compare against the climatological and hydro, hydrographic and satellite data sets um, that are essentially the most complete information we have in order to assess the, um, the, the realism of the model. The diagram here is an indication of the type of ecosystem scheme that we're using. It's in the category of sort of more complete um, standard biogeochemical simulation models, obviously limited in, in it's the completeness of its trophic level depiction. And that topic will come up more later. Um, below are listed the two primary papers currently in review, um, reporting on, on the results of, of these simulations and the validation exercise. Now, let me say a little bit about validation. Um, that models are, of course, incomplete and imperfect, and they always will be. Measurements greatly undersample nature compared to the true variability, and nature never repeats herself uh, because of intrinsic variability. And so there is never possible a precise comparison between models and nature. Rather, it is a matter of trying to make bulk, usually statistical comparisons, um, to essentially confirm uh, general similarity of the, the answers. Um, an approximate precision, but seeking a high fidelity in, in modeling the phenomena, the processes, and the relationships between different quantities. Um, experience with modeling shows that this is often achievable, um, often quite skillfully by this loose standard, but it can be quite a subtle thing to judge. And so 
in a short presentation like this, or even one twice as long, it's very hard to really um, give a full sense of, of the validation. Um, that's what these two papers listed um, attempt to do. Just to give you a feel for it, here's a comparison of two fields and time average over this reanalysis period. Um, the observational data on uh, the left of sea surface temperature and sea surface height, both measured from satellites, and the model result on the right. And you see the, the, the general pattern of cold coastal upwelling increasing mostly to the north, um, the general pattern of low sea level along the coast in association with the uh, California currents themselves. Um, another comparison getting more into the interior is, is with the historical hydrographic data where a property diagram of essentially a, a probability distribution function of the joint occurrence of potential temperature and salinity values with the cross lines being um, density contours uh, reference to the surface. And you see a comparison of the model and the data. It's easy to see discrepancies, particularly among the, the outlier uh, values, but a, a, a general um, agreement. And then as a final illustration, here are cross sections on a particular repeated Kalkofi line of nitrate and oxygen um, in the model and, and in the observations. Um, again, with a sort of similar comment about um, approximate agreement. Now, getting into things more related to the oxygen and, and hypoxia, uh, I mean, and acidification signals, here, for example, from the model, now without data comparisons, are comparisons of time series um, against latitude um, with a certain cross shore averaging um, of temperature, um, the volume fraction of aragonite under saturation, that is acidification, and the volume fraction of low oxygen. You see in the time series um, a particular dramatic El Nino event in, in 1997 and 98, um, but otherwise sort of the small variations. It's on a longer time sale that you will see the global warming. On the other hand, you can clearly see the increasing acidification and hypoxia in, in the annual cycle oscillations of aragonite and oxygen. On the left are the along coast profiles um, with different thresholds in the oxygen and, and aragonite um, for the, the, air, the volume um, at risk. And you see the time trends um, on the right, and they're all increasing um, temperature, um, acidification, and hypoxia. Looking in more detail, and now trying to get at the, the issue of um, geographical distributions of these signals, we shift from the whole coast model to the higher resolution uh, north and south subdomains. The two subdomains are superimposed here with the marine, the mean oxygen and, and aragonite signals. You see the superposition is, is essentially seamless in these fields. That's an indication of the skill of, of the downscaling. The focus in the paper listed at the bottom is to establish what has been partly known before, but to carry it to much higher resolution, how mesoscale and sub-mesoscale eddy fluxes of oxygen, nitrogen, and other quantities importantly influence the, the mean state and variability um, of the system. The next plot begins to get at the, the geographical distribution um, where what you see is along the x-axis, the latitude. These are plots of quantities at 50 meters depth along the coast near the 100 meter isobath, that is near the outer edge of the continental shelf. Um, their time mean statistics over the, the reanalysis period. And, and in the oxygen, you see the mean curve in blue with various geographical indicators. And um, in 
uh, red, you see the RMS variability. And there is substantial along coast variation in these quantities. Similarly for oregonite at the bottom, um, where um, in general, the oregonite problem is more severe in the northern coast, less severe in the south, but the variability is also higher there. The approximate explanation for this is, is where the wind-driven upwelling tilts the picnocline closer to the surface, which leads to strong alongshore currents, which leads to strong eddy processes and high variability. You also see in this fine scale fluctuations, a number of signals on very small scales, essentially the scale of headlands and bays. And some of these signals are statistical sampling flukes. Some of them are geographically, uh, climatologically persistent differences. And we're now trying to develop that story in more detail. Just to mention a few of the additional projects, one which Curtis will talk about shortly is on future climate scenarios where rather than just trying to replicate the, the, the IPCC type of, of future simulations, we've essentially done um, mechanistic attribution experiments in which we've taken four different perturbations as depicted in the hundred year changes in global earth system models. Um, the winds, the stratification, the heating, the biogeochemical tracers, um, the light changes associated with cloud changes and then compositing them and doing a downscaling, essentially a, a repetition of the reanalysis simulations except with shifts in the mean forcing. The conclusion is that all of these changes are consequent for the ecosystem Interestingly, the one that has received historically the most attention, the wind changes, hence the upwelling changes, is the least impactful of all of these, um, and the others are more so. The primary conclusion is that the region cannot escape the global change, and that's not surprising, but demonstrated here in a downscale. Another topic, which this one will be talked about by Faisal, is the regional anthropogenic pollution impacts where the protocol is to add local forcing in the Southern California region with a fine grid scale of 300 meters and compare simulations um, that have the extra regional forcing in addition to the global downscaling forcing with those that don't. The general conclusion is that the local anthropogenic impact is large on primary productivity and, and, and biomass, and it's mainly by the, the effluent um, ammonium. Um, and we're now beginning to do a similar project with funding from the San Francisco Bay Estuary Institute um, <coughs> um, for the central coast with, with um, the anthropogenic pollution there, both agricultural and, and urban. Um, just to talk about a, a particular topic, others won't. Um, this nearshore environment is clearly distinctive, both shallow water and the impact of surface waves and the nearshore um, anthropogenic forcing. And so we're looking in particular at this with very high resolution downscales here in the example given to 36 meters. And what you see in the lower right is essentially a protocol of a number of different near, shore, near surface release sites of, of material that is neutrally buoyant and is tracked following the flow. And in the next figure is a particular illustration of a three day event off of a Santa Barbara headland in which the group of particles in the upper right color coded by depth that is initially very close to the surface, move rapidly along shore, separate into a headland wake, which forms a very strong submesoscale front, which causes the particles to descend to depths around 30 meters, all within a, a, a time scale of, of um, just a few days. And so here is a cross shore exchange, uh, vertical exchange event 
under the influence um, in, in future simulations of surface gravity waves um, that is quite distinctive from the larger scale offshore behavior. There are a number of other current modeling projects um, that essentially are outgrowths of um, the ones I've described. Daniel Bianchi will be talking about one of them. The others I'll just skip over here um, because we're limited in time. But I think that the potential here for exploring a number of, of issues in model solutions is, is really a, a sort of wonderful um, opportunity um, for scientific discovery. So just to summarize, a skillful U.S. West Coast simulation model has been constructed, is being deployed on a variety of regional and local problems. We're moving into an era, and this project I think is, is an illustration, in which um, not only are the global changes and their local impacts uh, very large signals that we need to explore, but the scientific approach of this kind of regional downscale modeling is, I think, an essential part of uh, the discovery and, and discussion um, context, um, model-based assessments and scenarios to guide environmental management. I think this is um, transitional. This, this is not a traditional tool for regional um, management discussions. And so the process starting with this kind of webinar or supported by this kind of webinar of how it becomes uh, tested and accepted is an important issue. It's laborious, but cheap compared to measurement and remediation. And um, it needs a, a scientific support basis that for the most part doesn't exist in the world yet, although it obviously does exist for the global climate change modeling community. Um, but it is something that, that we have begun and, and needs to be continued. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. For those of us just joining us or joined during the presentation, we're moving on to our second speaker now. And we're going to move on to Curtis Deutsch. Curtis, if you want to share your screen. We have a couple questions coming in, but we're going to save those until the end. So let's see. Curtis, you'll also have to unmute yourself. And we also have a couple of ocean acidification hypoxia science panelists joining us today too. Thanks for joining. Okay, we see your slides, Curtis. Still no audio. Ah. Um, oh, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Great. Well, good take it away. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to some. Um, I'm going to pick up where Jim left off on one of the threads that's uh, kind of. Uh, spun out of the foundational work on um, developing both hindcasts um, of uh, the California current system using ROMs. And the particular thread I want to talk about is uh, using those simulations to understand how aerobic habitat changes both in the past through natural climate variability and into the future. Um, and I want to uh, highlight one particular case study, the first case study that we've undertaken um, to use this uh, a physiological framework together with the model simulations to understand uh, historical changes and project future habitat compression for one species, the northern ant. Um, there's a long list of collaborators you can see here, uh, as well as uh, funding sources that have supported this group, this work over the past uh, several years. So to start with a bit of global context, uh, as most of you will know, um, there are a variety of climatic changes that are influencing the ocean on a global scale. Uh, many of those have uh, rather direct uh, biological and ecological consequences. 
So here we're looking at um, an average among many global climate simulations for the changes in sea surface temperature and surface pH, uh, and then below the oxygen concentration in the subsurface waters, as well as the uh, depth integrated net primary productivity. Uh, the stippling indicates where models agree about the direction of the change. And you can see that for the most part, uh, temperature and pH are mostly stippled. Oxygen also, uh, at least in the North Pacific. Um, and in fact, the North Pacific ten, uh, tends to be an area where uh, many of these changes are at their most rapid over the, the next, over this uh, century. Um, however, the California current system in particular um, has to be viewed with a grain of salt in these models because they don't resolve coastal processes. Um, and so part of our goal uh, here has been to um, downscale from these projections to um, the California current in which we have some confidence in the model's ability to, to reproduce key uh, circulations and, and biogeochemical processes on the shelf. In particular, I'm going to focus on uh, two um, stresses to organisms, temperature and oxygen. And at a global scale, we know that as the ocean warms on the left, the heat content rises, we see oxygen declining. So historical observations show that very clearly, uh, consistent with what the future projections also uh, showed in the previous slide. At the same time that uh, temperatures are rising and oxygen is declining, on an on a organism scale on the right, you see that the critical oxygen pressure required to maintain uh, basic metabolic rates uh, rises as temperature goes up. So uh, as temperature rises, organisms become uh, less tolerant of low oxygen. Their requirement for oxygen rises. And what that means is there's sort of a, a declining supply from the ocean and an increasing demand from the organism. Um, and if the supply and demand no longer balance, then uh, we've got a, a difficult, uh, a loss of, of viable habitat for a uh, population. Um, so a very simple way of uh, making those uh, qualitative statements more uh, quantitative is uh, shown here on the left. It's just a kind of cartoon of the type of uh, curve that typically defines the boundary between habitable water and uninhabitable water. Uh, in temperature and oxygen space. So the, the exponentially rising blue curve uh, characterizes most of the data that we have on how oxygen tolerance increases uh, with temperature or how oxygen tolerance decreases with rising temperature, oxygen requirements increase. Um, and you can describe that uh, data very well with a very simple kind of uh, quasi exponential curve. Uh, that we term the metabolic index, and we denote it with the Greek symbol phi. Um, so um, there are a number of things we need to know to characterize uh, a particular uh, metabolic index. We need to know what the environment is, but we also need to know characteristics of the species that live in that environment. And there are two basic traits that are important. One is the overall height of that blue curve at a reference temperature. We're going to call that the intercept or in, in notation, it's uh, A naught. So that governs the height of the oxygen tolerance overall. And then the temperature sensitivity of that tolerance uh, is E naught. So that's sort of the rate at which, or the amount by which the uh, oxygen tolerance changes uh, with temperature. So if we know something about both the height of the curve and the slope of the curve, we can define and something about the large scale environment, we can define the regions where water is habitable for a given species and where it's uninhabitable. Um, it turns out we have uh, a lot of data on this from many decades of physiologists making these kinds of measurements. And those are compiled here uh, in a map view showing that there's relatively, uh, there is some global co coverage, although it's relatively uh, uh, more sparse in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, much more dense in the Atlantic Ocean. Nevertheless, we do have um, some coverage of the California current system with respect to these uh, physiological measurements. And we can characterize the global diversity of the two traits that I mentioned before, 
the overall hypoxia tolerance or, or its inverse vulnerability on the left and the overall temperature sensitivity of that uh, hypoxia tolerance on the right. And we have enough species and enough taxonomic diversity that we can begin to see um, the frequency distribution uh, of, among global species for the, the presence of those traits. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's a relatively modest number. I think six of these species are from the California current, um, but we can use the, the global uh, frequency distributions of these traits to explore uh, scenarios for the California current. But that's what we've done, and we've been guided in part by uh, previous analyses that showed uh, using the very rich uh, biological time series data from the Southern California Bight through the Cal Coffee program, uh, that oxygen has been a key, uh, in fact, the leading um, predictor variable for decadal fluctuations in the biomass of uh, uh, pelagic uh, fish species, small pelagics. Um, that was nicely shown in a series of papers by Tony Koslow on the right, um, showing the first principal component of the uh, larval abundance of uh, pelagic, small pelagic fish, um, correlated against the mean oxygen in the depth range from 200 to 400 meters. And you can see that uh, there's been a tendency to for oxygen to rise in the early uh, decades of the time series, um, followed by a rather sharp decline in, in the recent couple of decades uh, for both oxygen and for the overall fish, uh, larval fish biomass. Um, uh, it's also important to note that of those species, none of them actually is within our database for metabolic index traits. That is, we don't have uh, uh, oxygen tolerances measured at multiple temperatures for any of the species that uh, are sampled by the Cal Coffee program. So our strategy has been to, do, to uh, search through species um, and determine for which of them um, we can explain both the time mean habitat boundaries and the variability over time by the same set of traits that we know from the global uh, diversity of, of animal physiology. And if we can find species for which we can explain both their distribution and their time variability with a set of, uh, with a single set of traits that will form the basis for a strong hypothesis that, that aerobic habitat is a key determinant of their uh, re geographic range and its variability. Of course, uh, geographic range and the environmental determinants of it, um, uh, the habitat for aerobic uh, viability are both very dynamic quantities. And so this is where uh, we probably could not do this uh, without the underlying um, model data. So that's shown here just in an uh, animation of the fraction of the water column that would be viable for a typical uh, species in the California mm -hmm. current, one who's uh, relatively sensitive to oxygen and temperature. And you can see um, both the seasonal cycle, you can see long-term trends if you stare at this animation long enough and intense eddy activity. And so um, we've combined historical um, uh, observations with these model simulations to explore the uh, correlations between uh, species abundance and geographic range and the environmental determinants based on temperature and oxygen. The first thing we needed to do, and Jim touched on this, is do a very extensive uh, validation of the model uh, behavior at a system level. So this included both uh, atmospheric forcing validation, uh, physical oceanographic validation, and biogeochemical tracers and rates from uh, hydrography and uh, satellites. And I'm just showing you two of the most important, two of the important ones for our purposes in evaluating aerobic habitat, uh, temperature on the top and oxygen on the bottom. Uh, the temperature uh, comparison is one that you already saw from Jim. So just picking up from where he left off and adding the oxygen on the bottom, um, comparing the uh, thermocline um, subsurface long-term mean distribution of oxygen from the model on the left with uh, its uh, observational counterpart from the World Ocean Atlas on the right. 
And you see that in both the temperature and the oxygen, there are uh, some features that are um, uh, discrepant, uh, but as far as broad scale patterns go, the model is capturing the, lo the long-term large scale uh, distribution of both properties. Um, we can also evaluate, uh, we also have evaluated the uh, controls on the, on the interannual uh, variability of oxygen um, and we find that the model represents the role of thermocline heaving um, quite uh, with quite high fidelity. Uh, and so we think that the, the, the drivers of interannual variability in oxygen in the model are, um, are also quite realistic. This and many other uh, aspects of model, model validation are, as Jim mentioned, contained in these two uh, uh, papers and um, just showing you here the ones that are relevant for evaluating aerobic habitat. So here we're looking at the metabolic index uh, and its distribution in the California current. You can see that it deep, the metabolic index, uh, which is the ratio of the amount of oxygen available relative to what's needed for uh, metabolic rates, uh, decreases offshore. Um, it also decreases with depth for most species traits and it decreases toward the south. So if we want to look for geographic range boundaries associated with a metabolic index, we wouldn't look for the offshore uh, range limit, but we could look for depth and southern range boundary limits due to the supply demand ratio of oxygen as characterized by the metabolic index. Um, we can turn those distributions into simpler single metrics of habitat volume. And here you see, we can look at all the species traits together. You see that those species with high tolerance for low oxygen have lots of habitat. Those that are more vulnerable uh, have a, a lower intercept in our previous cartoon picture, have little habitat. And in between you see the, that the variations in the habitat volume can be quite strong. This is relative to the mean. So on the order of 20 to 30% of the habitat can fluctuate on an interannual to decadal time scale uh, based on these model simulations. Um, so there's many species in the California current that are likely to experience strong fluctuations in habitat availability based on temperature and oxygen. Uh, and we looked at one in particular as our first case study, the Northern anchovy. So here uh, you're looking at the distribution of anchovy on the left um, in two seasons. Um, and the color field in the background is the fraction of their uh, typical depth range that would be habitable given a particular uh, combination of traits for the metabolic index. Of course, we don't have measurements for those traits, but it turns out that uh, within the range of globally observed traits, um, we can narrow that range quite substantially by uh, using the anchovies current range. To, to infer the most likely trait combinations. And that's shown in the upper right, uh, where the, the thin gray lines uh, show you the likelihood of a given set of metabolic index parameters uh, and their ability to explain the distribution of, of the adult anchovy. Um, the black, solid black line in that picture comes from the uh, time variability, which we'll look at next. Um, so that's shown in the upper uh, panel here. The, the observations of larval abundance are in red. They come directly from the Cal Coffee uh, time series observations going back to the 1950s. And the other two uh, lines denote the metabolic index and the volume of habitat that is uh, associated with that. And you see a very strong correlation between the larval abundance and the availability of aerobically viable habitat. Um, and this one particular, on top one particular trait combination, but we um, can again use this, uh, these correlations to zoom in on the, the likely trait combinations for anchovy. Um, and what we find is that in the middle panel, uh, the temporal variability and the large scale spatial distribution of anchovy both point toward the same uh, region of trait space as being likely to, to represent the uh, metabolic uh, sensitivities of anchovy. Um, we're gonna measure those. I'll come back to that at the, at the end. Um, the bottom panel just shows you what happens as we project out based on that 
uh, well, as you uh, correlate the change in habitat volume to the larval abundance using the different decades from the Cal Coffee survey, so the 1980s being a relatively good decade, uh, 1950s sort of intermediate, and 2000s seeming to head into uh, a period of extremely low oxygen uh, reduced habitat availability. Um, uh, Jim mentioned that we can uh, downscale global simulations for the future, and we've done that here uh, for a variety of, for the whole, all the system properties, but I'm just showing you here the results for oxygen on the left and temperature on the right, um, broken down by um, the different climate forcings that give rise to this uh, anomalies within the uh, California current. This is at depths less than 200 meters on the shelf. And you see that the warming um, and oxygen in uh, orange bars are fairly similar to what the global models predict. Um, and they're mostly explainable by the combination of um, stratification, that is a sort of basin scale increase in the density stratification, mostly from upper ocean warming, and from the import of remote biogeochemical tracer changes, nutrients and oxygen into the California current. The winds act as a lesser, uh, a secondary uh, modulator of the overall response. And that suggests that we can, um, uh, this downscaling suggests that we can uh, make some relatively, uh, we can draw some conclusions about the likely uh, rate and magnitude of changes from the climate at the broad scale in within the California current. So the last comment here in this talk is to use that uh, together with the historical analysis of uh, anchovy climate or anchovy habitat variability to make a projection for how the combination of warming and oxygen loss in the California current would likely contract the, the habitat range for anchovy. So on the left, you're looking at the, the, the current anchovy range. The color in, in the bubbles, the color shows you the, the, the fractional loss of current habitat from the combination of warming and oxygen loss. And on the right, the curves uh, illustrate the kind of uh, northward contraction of the range limit uh, that, that the statistical historical analysis was, would predict in the face of uh, ongoing oxygen loss and warming. Um, last thing to say though is that anchovy uh, will have one particular um, set of metabolic index traits. Other species within the California current are likely to occupy other areas of, of these this parameter space describing oxygen tolerance and temperature sensitivity. And the amount of habitat loss varies quite strongly depending on the, uh, those two particular traits. Um, and so there's going to be um, quite likely uh, unanticipated ecosystem implications from having differential loss of habitat uh, species who are living in the same parts of the water column being separated by uh, differential loss of habitat, new species associations are likely to emerge from it. Um, one of the things that's quite exciting now for us is to uh, look forward to new measurements in a um, project that's being supported by uh, NOAA and California Sea Grant to actually measure the, the metabolic index parameters through respirometry on more than 10 California current species. Um, this is a collaboration with SQRP and uh, University of South Florida, Brad Seibel will be doing the respirometry and we're um, expecting a strong connection of the results to uh, management agencies uh, facilitated by the work of Squirt and Martha Satula. Um, and we're uh, looking forward to putting some uh, many more actual species on uh, this picture of how habitat loss is likely to differentially impact uh, health and current. So with that, um, I'll pass the baton and, and save questions for the, the group session. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to our next speaker, Faisal Kasori. He is a senior scientist at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. Faisal, if you want to share your slides and make sure your audio is turned on. Yeah. And a reminder to folks to chat in your questions to us. We're going to get those at the end. We have two more speakers. All right, looks like we can see your screen. 
Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. Take it yeah. away. Uh, thank you. Thanks for org organizing uh, the webinar. So uh, I'm going to talk about the investigation of effect of local uh, anthropogenic inputs on acidification hypoxia in uh, the southern California Bay. So I'm stepping a little bit back in time when the common uh, wisdom in California, because of the dominance of the operating system, uh, the coming nutrients from the land or from the atmosphere cannot have a role on ocean acidification in, uh, in, in, in the coastal shelf of, uh, of the bight. But recent science discussions recognize that possible effects of these inputs uh, can happen, and this could happen actually uh, via eutrophication, where uh, when the blooms, you know, the new newly formed organic matter uh, decay to subsurface and uh, get get respired by uh, respired and consume oxygen and produce uh, carbon. So now our uh, objective is to uh, identify, uh, you know, the role of the, 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 the separate, separate the role of natural variability from the role of the local anthropogenic nutrients. So uh, we are using models that can be run with, uh, you know, uh, with, separate, sep with separate sources of contribution and, uh, and test the effect of each source. So we need, uh, we need a mechanistic model. And what we have is a model that uh, predict a uh, cycle of, uh, of uh, lower trophic ecosystem. So phytoplankton consumes nutrients. We have full cycles of nutrients, of, car of carbon and of oxygen. So we can produce the mechanism I was talking about that leads in our know, related notification to subsurface ocean acidification and hypoxia. So in particular, because we are also using ROMS, ROMS is, uh, is capable of predicting realistic transport of coastal material at very fine scale. So what we are using in this domain, we are forcing the, the, this uh, domain in the bite by uh, the one kilometer resolution to get uh, consistent boundary conditions. So we compiled two decades of data with our partners. So we are capable of running two decades of simulation. My today's talk is focusing on the first results of uh, the first few years. Uh, so here we are. Uh, Forcing the model to represent uh, inputs of 40 reverse runoffs, 18 PRW underwater outfalls, and atmospheric deposition of nitrogen uh, uh, and carbon, including also local, uh, including also you know, separate scenarios that represent the uh, local urban uh, dome of carbon uh, on top of uh, uh, the large cities in uh, Southern California. So uh, we previously previously uh, decided, agreed with stakeholders to run first two scenarios. The first one is a natural uh, a model including only natural variability and another scenario including natural variability plus the anthropogenic uh, data I was talking about. So what I want you to understand also is that uh, most of the nut nutrient contribution comes from uh, the effluents. So in, uh, uh, in uh, May 2019, this spring, we uh, presented the first results of uh, the effect of the anthropogenic nutrients on the chlorophyll nutrient cycles, oxygen and pH. We presented validation of the model against uh, the observation at, uh, at small scale uh, by focusing specifically on anthropogenic gradients. And we discussed these findings with uh, stakeholders. I'm, go I'm going to present some of uh, the results today. One of the most important results is uh, actually the nutrient is widely dispersed by the ocean currents far from the sources. So when you compare concentration of ammonia, which represents the most important uh, in terms of, of sources, most important nutrient in terms of sources, coming actually from rivers and from outfalls, when you compare simulation with, no, with only a natural variability, to simulation including the atmospheric deposition, deposition and the land-based inputs, you see that uh, you know the ammonia never get uh, get higher than uh, two micromolars usually in, in the nature, but here you can see values that exceed that uh, that that number. When I run the simulation, like I hope it's gonna work. Okay, yes, you can see that the ammonia is widely dispersed very quickly by the currents. 
uh, all along, specifically, it's, it's mostly following the topography, but it also can go a little bit, far, a little bit offshore. So you see that the high concentration, the plume goes very, very, very far from, uh, from the, uh, the source that are mainly located here, here and in, in Orange County here, and also from uh, the most important rivers here. So what happens to these nutrients? I will tell you part of it is uh, nat uh, naturified. A part of it is just dispersed widely in the ocean and the part of it is consumed by phytoplankton. So as you can see here, comparison of uh, a surface concentration of chlorophyll from satellite compared to the model including the anthropogenic forcing and the model with only variability, only natural variability. And you can see that this simulation is very, is showing very similar concentration of, of chlorophyll at the surface as uh, what we are seeing in the satellite. So this is in average over, um, over a spring period of the first years of simulation. But actually, when you look at the time series where we are comparing the, cost, uh, the surface concentration of chlorophyll at the coast, uh, in red for the anthropogenic forcing and in green for the simulation with natural variability, you see that the high concentration of chlorophyll happens also in other seasons than the spring. So we have uh, almost all the year uh, increase of chlorophyll uh, at the coast. So when we, uh, when we look at the uh, percentage of change of, uh, of uh, chlorophyll concentration over a few years, or here is uh, a few years, we, we, we saw that we have an important increase of, of chlorophyll concentration because of the increase of productivity. And we have also, I'm not showing it here, but we are, we are also seeing uh, an increase of surface, surface oxygen and pH because of photosynthesis. And when we go a little bit deeper, at subsurface, just below the aphotic zone, you see that we decrease the concentration of oxygen and we, and we decrease also the pH uh, below, so below the aphotic, uh, aphotic zone. So uh, we just show you that, uh, that we found an increase of chlorophyll and oxygen and pH at the surface and decay at depth. So I didn't talk about physics, but I did just I just want you to know that uh, the physics is uh, I mean the, the, the vertical shape of, of, the, of, of the physics uh, is uh, really dri dri driving this you know this top down connectivity between between the, the high, high productivity at the surface and uh, important consumption at depth. So for that reason, we need to, con to convince ourselves that the model is producing the anthropogenic gradients. And here are the most important are the vertical and uh, the seasonal scale. And in one of the exercises we did with stakeholders, we identified together all the most important gradients uh, that the model, the model needs to produce. So uh, in fact, after uh, validation, uh, very complex validation, we found that the model is faithfully producing all these gradients uh, as an example the, as an example, you know, uh, I'm showing this comparison of oxygen profiles in two different seasons where we are comparing an average profile, profile this is of uh, Los Angeles area, where the model is, you know, uh, capable of getting the right, uh, right shape and right range of variability as we are seeing in the observations. So uh, I showed you that the model is predicting important differences in the Southern California shelf for biogeochemical cycles, nutrients and oxygen and pH. So, uh, and we managed to validate those uh, variability. Now the question is, uh, are those differences significant enough to warrant management attention? So clearly the science has the role to provide information to this question, but there is another component that is the policy that we cannot speak to. However, we, uh, in order to get uh, the conversation started, we apply thresholds using uh, two methodologies based on the California Ocean Plan. The first consists on looking at a deviation in percentage for oxygen and in units for pH uh, from the natural deviation. And we compare it to another methodology. The second one is actually based on uh, biological relevance. Uh, so in, in that one, we just estimate the possible uh, compression of habitats for certain species that could affect, uh, could be affected by depression of oxygen at depth or by excess of acidification also 
uh, at depth. So here I'm going to show you two examples as a quick summary. We can tell you that uh, we found uh, an excursion of the thresholds for both approaches. The, um, so here is, the first example is based on what Curtis was presented about the metabolic index. We are applying the methodology on the Northern, or Northern Onshovi. My example is uh, in a region in Santa Monica Bay, a region that has many uh, source of nutrients. And the a second application is based on pteropods. They are sea snails, very vulnerable to, to ocean acidification. So, and we applied a um, methodology, methodology developed by Bednar Sekitar. So in both exercises, I'm showing a time series of the uh, possible habitat depth change. The positive values, the, the, the red means that we are reducing the habitat uh, uh, because of the anthropogenic forcing. And when it's green, that means we are uh, increasing the, uh, the, the size of the habitat. So in, in, in both uh, examples, you see that most of the time during the three years of simulation, we are uh, reducing actually the habitat, or we are squeezing the habitat of uh, of each of these species. So, so the the you know the model is bringing us outputs uh, and data streams of million of cells for each time step, and because of all this variability, you know we are uh, we clearly need to uh, specify the scale of our assessment. We it, it we need to. To specify the regions, specify the time, uh, which time time step or which time um, uh, we we need to we need to apply our statistics. So we also needed to aggregate aggregate data in time and in space. There are also uh, other other questions to help to interpret the, 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 the this numerical objective, which are, for example, other factors that could that could change the shape of the plume or change the uh, um, the, uh, uh, the answer from, you know, uh, result from the model. One of them is what is the actual effect of freshwater versus the effect of nutrient, it, uh, nutrient only. I'm, I'm coming back to this, uh, to this example by the end of my presentation. So uh, when we start thinking about the biological assessment, we ask ourselves the same question as the numerical objectives. But we also have additional questions, such as uh, you know what species and what habitats are, are the most relevant to our assessment. So we needed to get consensus between uh, biologists to identify the metrics and the severity indices uh, that are the most required to, to to apply our interpretation. So actually, uh, the stakeholders uh, with 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 the scientists work are very engaged and they are moving discussion forward. So they, um, they elected two sub subcommittees. The first one is uh, based on, uh, is very, um, it's going to be spe specific on the approach. Uh, it's gonna be led by Katrin Walsh. So they are going to uh, work with us on developing the, the, the most appropriate approach for uh, understanding the impact, the possible impact from our runs and from future runs we are going to decide together. And second subcommittee is focusing on validation. Uh, you know, we are working with them to complete the validation to their satisfaction. And we are also working with them to identify uh, additional uh, model scenarios. Uh, some examples are just written here. So the, some exa examples uh, uh, concern source attribution of, of, of of the nutrients and also climate change impacts. And one additional so, uh, scenario is becoming very popular among the, uh, the, the managers and it concerns the, uh, uh, the water recycling. In fact, we, have, we are starting a project uh, sponsored by OCSD where we are testing scenarios including wastewater recycling because we think that plume dispersion with and without recycling could have a, a possible effect on the fate of the plume and possibly could impact or influence the, the concentration of oxygen and pH uh, at depth. So as you can see, an example where we are comparing a model with actual parameterization and parameterization including water recycling, uh, 
uh, developed by our student Minaho uh, at UCLA, where you see that the model when we use, when we consider water recycling or half of, of uh, we, we, we recycle half of the water, the plume could stay a little bit deeper uh, in the ocean. So uh, we have also formed a collaboration to uh, mimic the same work we are doing in Southern California Bite, this time in Central California, where we would like to estimate, uh, identify, I mean, the uh, effect of nutrients coming from San Francisco, San Francisco Bay and Salina Rivers Valley uh, on the ecosystem in this, uh, in this region. So we are op we opened collaboration with uh, CFEI and the University of Santa Cruz and other uh, partners uh, in, in Central California. So thank you for listening and uh, we'd be happy to get your, take your questions or get your questions offline by email or by phone. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have one speaker left. For those who joined during presentations, you first heard from Jim McWilliams. He gave an overview of the model and model validation. Next you heard from Curtis Deutsch. He talked about implications of climate change on fish habitat in the California current. You just heard from Faisal Kastori, who gave an update on nutrient inputs on acidification hypoxia in the Southern California Bight. And lastly, you're going to hear from Daniele Bianchi. He's going to talk about leveraging a California current system, ocean acidification hypoxia model for future applications, fisheries, productivity, harmful algal blooms, and the nitrogen cycle. And then we're going to have plenty of time for, time for questions at the end. We're getting a lot of those chatted in, so feel free to continue to bring in your questions to us and uh, take it away, Daniele. Okay, thank you, Haley, for uh, introducing my talk and, well, for putting together this webinar in the first place uh, and uh, to everyone who's listening. So uh, this is, I'm going to give a <clears throat> quick overview of, an, of a series of projects that uh, use uh, the model system that has been developed over the uh, past uh, few years or several years at UCLA. Uh, and this is really a collaboration of many institutions and many PIs that are listed here uh, that receive funding from uh, many uh, funding agencies, uh, the Ocean Protection Council, the National Science Foundation, uh, NOAA, and uh, University of California, uh, Los Angeles. Um, let me see. Okay, I'm going to start a little bit with a global picture that Jim and Curtis have already uh, introduced very well. And we know that the uh, ocean will be affected by global change, in particular warming, acidification, uh, deoxygenation, and uh, decline in primary production. Um, an example uh, that I'm showing here is a, is a projection of uh, the change in primary production by the end of the century uh, from the IPCC fifth assessment report. Uh, this is um, wherever you see blue colors, uh, primary production is projected to decline by uh, many models. Uh, the, the dots show where the models uh, agree with each other. And really the point is that uh, the regional manifestation of this uh, global change is very uncertain. Uh, we think in the California current productivity will decline, but the model, uh, the robustness of this projection is not very strong and some of the models disagree uh, with, the, with, the, with each other. There is also local scale human imp impacts that will be important uh, in a place like uh, the California current. And I'm bringing up a figure that Faisal has already shown um, that basically our, our model simulation suggests that uh, local, very local nutrient inputs uh, can really affect uh, the ecosystem. In this case, uh, model simulation without uh, anthropogenic inputs uh, are not able to capture the observed uh, biomass uh, of phytoplankton in the water. And so these are uh, processes that are not included in the global projection, but need to be included uh, regionally. And so our uh, regional earth system model, which has been already presented by, uh, by, by, by Jim and, and, and the other um, webinars, uh, is, um, I think is an ideal tool to explore uh, how these global and local impacts uh, or um, effects uh, are projected uh, regionally in a place uh, like the California current. And so we have a series of uh, side projects or, or projects that are funded uh, under uh, different funding um, uh, grants uh, that basically build up on uh, this uh, modeling system. And the first one is uh, that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a very quick overview. Uh, the first one is uh, food web and fishery productivity. The second is uh, a project to model harmful algal blooms. Uh, and the third one uh, is a, uh, an investigation of the nitrogen cycle and nitrous ox oxide emissions uh, in the California current. 
So I'll start with the food web and fishery productivity modeling. Um, this is uh, a project uh, funded by the Ocean Protection Council uh, with funding also from University of uh, uh, California, Los Angeles. And this work uh, is done mostly at UCLA by Jerome Guillet, uh, Faisal Kessouri and all the modeling uh, team uh, and also with input from Square. And to start, uh, to get everyone started, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, this uh, map, uh, which is from, um, it, it's, a, it's a future projection of the fish biomass change uh, by the end of the century for a um, high emission uh, scenario, uh, RCP 8.5. Uh, it's from the uh, fish meat project that uh, has just been uh, published in, P in uh, PNAS. Everywhere you see uh, red colors, uh, these multi-model projections uh, that, that are based on very different models that are forced with the IPCC uh, climate um, projection. Wherever you see red colors, um, um, the model uh, projects the decline in fish biomass. On average, it's about um, 50, 15%. Uh, but really, again, if we zoom uh, at the regional scale, uh, models disagree with each other and uh, projections are very uncertain. And so if you want to downscale uh, this type of impacts uh, in a region like the California current ecosystem, we need regional food web models that are uh, designed and validated and constrained uh, to capture uh, a specific region. And so at UCLA, we are developing this uh, a, a regional model of the California current food web, uh, which is also designed to be driven and coupled to our regional earth system model. And uh, in this slide, I'm going to uh, guide you uh, very quickly, uh, since I don't have much time, uh, on, on um, how the model is designed. It takes input from uh, our ocean model, ocean biogeochemical and circulation model, uh, for example, temperature, but also biomass of lower trophic level, uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and the tritus biomass. Um, this input is, is uh, utilized to define habitats and drive uh, and resolve the interaction of three uh, communities of fish. Um, the epipelagic community uh, in the top uh, couple of hundred meters, a mesopelagic community uh, that is more dominant offshore, and a migratory community that moves between the surface and uh, the mesopelagic. These community uh, are resolved uh, as biomass size spectra and each community contains multiple species. Uh, there is a, a sense of diversity in the asymptotic size. And this model is based on size. Size is the dominant uh, variable that controls all the ecological interaction, the physiological rates, uh, movement, and all the, all the ecological uh, properties. And finally, uh, all these calculations are done at each grid cell, but the grid cells of the model are uh, three-dimensional. They communicate with each other. And so the, the model provides uh, really a dynamically, uh, especially and temporally resolved uh, dynamical representation of the, of the food web. I uh, wish I had more time to go into the detail, but uh, I'll have to skip a little bit on how we try to constrain uh, this model with observations. Uh, we use a variety of observations from the California current, uh, trolls uh, that I'm gonna talk about, but also acoustic observation and fishery uh, observations. Uh, the trolls are, in, an essential uh, type of observation. Uh, we have about 2,000 surface troll um, that sample the epipelagic and migratory community. Uh, these are from NOAA surveys. Uh, they are uh, at the surface. Uh, they are uh, from uh, very large uh, trolls uh, and they tell us information on the biomass distribution but also the diversity of uh, epipelagic and migratory uh, species. And these are all the black dots on the, on the, on the map. We also have observation from midwater trolls. There is less, uh, fewer of these observations. Uh, these are important because they give us a, a sense of the vertical distribution, uh, mostly of the mesopelagic and the migratory community. Uh, the important thing to note is that this, uh, obs this type of observation have been collected over about 16 years. They are sporadic uh, in space and time, and they sample a very, very strong variability, in particular for the uh, epipelagic uh, community. And so we are working to uh, try to boil down this observation and aggregate them at a scale that uh, the model can be uh, compared with uh, in, a, in a proper way. And Jim has, uh, has already talked about the uh, sort of the philosophy and pitfalls of uh, model uh, validation and comparison with observation. And so we have uh, divided our domain in about 15 biogeochemically coherent biomes. In each of the biomes, we take all the trolls and we create a statistical representation of the biom biomass distribution. And here I'm showing two biomes, one from the north, one from the south. Um, of the biomass distribution. Uh, we can also boil down this type of information, statistical information, uh, even uh, further. 
and for example, um, summarize it as box plot that for each biome show the, uh, the statistical distribution and as median uh, range and uh, mean of the biomass distribution. And of course, there are many, many other ways you can slice this data, but I'm gonna use this box plot to uh, give you a sense of how the model and the observation look like. Um, so I'm gonna show you here observations in black. Uh, this is the migratory biomass for the biomes for which we have observations. Again, the box plot show the uh, distribution of the trolls, uh, the troll biomass. Uh, this is the epipelagic biomass. Um, I would say that uh, observations uh, show uh, regional trends that are fairly coherent across biomes uh, that follow environmental driver. Primary production is um, one of the variables that mostly explain the variability uh, among different biomes. Uh, there is also a very large um, range in epipelagic biomass, which I would say is caused uh, by both sampling and uh, inner and variability in the uh, epipelagic ecosystem uh, and the organisms that move and, that, and they are affected by the currents and aggregate uh, in a different way. So if we, uh, I'm gonna show you now, uh, I'm overlapping on top of the observation a model run, a specific model run, we're still working on the model, uh, but just to give you a sense of how the model can capture some of the trends that we see in observation. This model was specifically tuned to have the right uh, mean comparable uh, compared to the observations. So the model captures some of the trend. Uh, it also has a very, very rich uh, dynamic that we are just starting to, uh, to analyze, but also has uh, some biases. And this is a work in progress that requires a lot of uh, computational time and, and analysis. But we are engaged right now in this uh, type of uh, model validation and, and fine tuning. And once completed, this model can be fully coupled uh, and forced by the uh, UCLA Regional Ocean Model Simulation. And what we plan to do is, uh, of course, analysis of the spatial and temporal variability and the drivers of this variability, uh, but also try to downscale uh, the impact of global change and look at uh, the various driver that uh, Jim and Curtis have already uh, explained, uh, warming, primary production decline. We can also use the model to uh, study local drivers, uh, human drivers, for example, the nutrient inputs uh, and their effect on primary production and the entire food web, uh, fishing and extraction of resources and establishment of uh, marine protected areas. Um, the second project that I'm going to guide you very quickly through uh, is a project that is funded by NOAA, is a uh, multi-institution collaboration with uh, University of California Santa Cruz, uh, SCUS, uh, SQRP, and uh, UCLA, uh, and is uh, focused on harmful algal bloom uh, modeling. Uh, there are several uh, species of phytoplankton that can uh, cause our, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, but we're gonna focus on a genus uh, of diatoms, uh, Pseudonitsa, uh, that are responsible for uh, producing a toxin, domoic acid, uh, behind the amnesic uh, shellfish, shellfish poisoning uh, syndrome. Uh, this is a toxin that has serious health uh, consequences with a range of symptoms that can be uh, mild to life-threatening, uh, it also has impact on uh, the ecosystem and in particular marine mammals and birds with thousands of strandings uh, that have been documented over, over the past 10 years and uh, death of uh, marine mammals. And finally, it is widespread in the United States uh, and harmful algal bloom have documented and are common, fairly common in California. In particular, you probably are uh, familiar with the 2015 uh, coast, uh, coastwide bloom that caused uh, substantial economic uh, damage. Uh, so the California current is affected, uh, but uh, the downside, the, well, the positive side is that we also have a lot of observation, probably more observation than in any other place. And what I'm showing here in the map uh, is observation of, um, uh, of dom domoic acid, uh, particularly domoic acid, so the toxin uh, in the water column during the uh, 2015 blooms. We have observation all along the California current, but we can also zoom uh, locally, and we have observation that are also very local, and this is a, a figure courtesy of uh, Jamie Smith uh, at Squirp that show uh, local domoic acid uh, measurement uh, near the city of Los Angeles and the Channel Island. So this type of data really gives us confidence that we can uh, try to start modeling uh, the drivers and the manifestation of these um, domoic acid and pseudonita harmful algal blooms. So with funding from NOAA, uh, we have just started a development of a, a mechanistic model of pseudonita and domoic acid production. It's based on sort of a simplified physiological understanding of uh, pseudonita and, uh, and the production of, of the toxin. 
It is constrained by, uh, by lab uh, experiments uh, that we are still uh, working with, but we have a, a baseline model that is fairly realistic. Uh, it is designed to be coupled to the fully three-dimensional uh, biogeochemically resolved uh, UCLA uh, ocean model. Uh, and of course, we'll be by the, by the uh, vast array of observation in the California current. And again, the purpose of this project is multifold. Uh, we want to investigate the drivers, the, the natural and, um, and uh, human drivers uh, of, of this type of hubs in the California current. In particular, we want to look at the uh, role of nutrient inputs. Uh, we know that um, in, uh, availability of nitrogen uh, nutrients uh, compared to silicon um, can uh, affect the production of the moic acid, can in fact facilitate uh, the production of this toxin. So we wanna, and we know that in our model, uh, nutrient inputs are extremely important uh, in driving um, the biomass of phytoplankton. And finally, we can use the model to also uh, do different scenario, for example, uh, the effect of uh, different nutrient management strategies uh, like um, the ones that Faisal has already discussed. And the final project, if I have a couple of minutes to go through that, uh, is really an investigation of the nitrogen cycle and nitrous oxide uh, emissions uh, in the California current. And this is work uh, funded uh, by NSF. Uh, NSF funded a global analysis of these processes, but we are also folding in an analysis of the California current itself, and is done uh, mostly at UCLA by Simon Yang, Faisal Kessouri, and the entire modeling team. Uh, to give you a very quick introduction, we know that in the California current and in a quelling system, low oxygen conditions or hypoxia also promote uh, removal of fixed nitrogen and production of uh, nitrous oxide. And then nitrous oxide is one of the, uh, is, a, is a very powerful greenhouse gas, about three, 300 times more potent than CO2, and is emitted in eastern boundary quelling system to the atmosphere. Um, over the gradients, um, uh, of oxygen concentrations found, um, found in, uh, in, uh, in aquiline regions. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is very dynamical. There are multiple species, multiple transformation. Uh, and I give you a, a quick sense of how complex these transformations are. Uh, and I don't have time to go in the detail, uh, but the message is that there is production of nitrous oxide that occurs during uh, ammonium oxidation and denitrification. And this nitrous oxide can end up uh, being emitted to the atmosphere. And we included this type, exactly this type of uh, dynamical uh, nitrogen cycle in our ocean model. Uh, and we are starting to apply that for regional studies in a quelling system, including the California current regions. The question are of course, multifold. Uh, for example, the importance of regional hypoxia and changes in hypoxia uh, for denitrification and nitrous oxide production, the drivers and magnitude of emissions of this uh, greenhouse gas to the atmosphere, uh, the role of global and local anthropogenic impacts, including nutrient uh, inputs. Uh, and as an example, a couple, one slide uh, more, uh, we just started a, a sort of a regional assessment of nitrous oxide sources. What I'm showing here is uh, an estimate of flux from the ocean to the atmosphere of nitrous oxide. And you can uh, see how the upwelling uh, region is really a hot spot of emission of this gas to the atmosphere. Uh, another result uh, that I really give you a, a, a very preliminary sense of uh, is that anthropogenic uh, nutrient inputs uh, could in fact enhance uh, emissions of uh, this greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. Uh, and you can see that by comparing a simulation with and without nutrient inputs. On the left is a um, nitrous oxide saturation state at the surface uh, in simulation that Faisal Kessouri did with, uh, without nutrient inputs, so that would be a natural a nitrous, nitrous oxide cycle, and on the right simulation with nutrient inputs that, sh that show hotspot uh, related to nitrification, but also a broad uh, dispersion of uh, nitrous oxide at the surface. And so this might be important for constraining the local budgets, not just in the ocean, but uh, also um, the budgets that are, uh, for example, from the city of Los Angeles. It might be affected by coastal emissions. So as a summary, we have this uh, regional system model. We are leveraging for a series of modeling studies, um, food web and fishery productivity, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, nitrogen cycle. And I probably said already everything that there was to say. And, and, and in, in the sake of time, I'm gonna stop here and, and uh, uh, leave time for more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all our presenters today for speaking and presenting. Now we're going to open up to questions from the public. 
And the task, we also have questions coming in from the task force members themselves, but in the interest of time, I'm going to get to some of the questions that came in earlier. One of them is from Angela. Um, how do you see cities supporting your work? For example, contributing to models or using the model and its outputs. And for any of the panelists who presented, feel free to unmute yourself and answer this question. Does anyone specifically want to take this? It's really a, this is Jim. It's, it's really a question of, of sort of localization of the information, localization of, of the measurements, localization of, of intended responses, um, particularly in an incoherent world like the one we currently live in on, on global climate change. Um, I think, you know, responses at all levels of, of social organization are relevant. Um, in particular, if you're trying to look for local information um, and involved in the modeling, um, then we can certainly try to arrange for access of information or shared analyses or something like that. It's just that you, know, you need skin in the game. Um, you know, human labor is, is the limitation in this kind of work. And so if you're interested, roll up your sleeves. Great, thank you. That question from, was from Angela in Canada, Angela Daniluk in Canada. And on that note, uh, Jim, we got a question from Michelle and Bush about what investments would be uh, needed. What do you see as the, the next step for investing in these models? Is it um, to help make them relevant for policymakers taking action in California, for example? Is it paying for time for the modelers to do more work, more measurements in the field, something else? If anyone wants to speak to that. I, I briefly spoke to it in my, in my summary slide. Uh, we essentially need to provide a, a framework for continuity of scientific work in what is a relatively new type of scientific work. And at the moment, you know, as you've heard, there, there are a number of sponsors on particular projects. Sponsors and projects come and go, uh, but people need to keep going. And so really the question is, is how do we collectively establish a framework that, that accomplishes that? Great, thank you. And since Jim, we have you on the line, we have another question from Angela saying, could you reiterate your thoughts on why aragonite drops the more north you go? Slide 13, she missed it. Was it because winds are moving up lower acidic or O2 poor stratified waters? and from Angela from Vancouver, British Columbia. Thanks for that question. Okay, well, I, I think this is established empirically. You know, Dick could speak to that, others could too. Um, it's a detailed analysis we have not yet made of, of that curve about the latitudinal distribution, but roughly speaking, um, you know, deep waters are more near the surface in, in polar regions and so the general dangers increase going forward. Great, thank you. We have another question from Alejandro. Good morning, are the hydrodynamics coupled to the wave model? What is the vision for including wave-driven turbulence into the coastal transport dynamics? Wave-driven turbulence, does that mean breaking waves, helping to force the nearshore littoral zone, or as an agent of transferring wind stress, um, or as just a, a general modification of the surface boundary layer that is generally represented by boundary layer turbulence parameterizations here. Those would all be ways that matter. And of course, wave current interaction is, is well understood in things like nearshore currents and Langmuir turbulence. Um, and those elements are being brought into the circulation models, particularly on smaller scales and nearer the shore. Alejandro, please let us know if that answers your question. I think he clarified saying breaking waves. Okay, thank you. 
We can move on to the next question. This is from Lisa Levin, one of the OAH science panelists. What measurements and where would improve the ground truthing or mechanistic understanding underpinning the modeling you were doing? And this could be out to any of the panelists. I, I keep hearing a vacuum. Um, the measurements that are most informative for models and most supportive of our models are some combination of climatologies where there are enough measurements that you can overcome the sampling limitations of, of point sampling or particular process studies where you can see particular relationships in time sequences or in the case of a lot of the biological modeling, the, the supporting um, physiological studies, which are not necessarily made just in the ocean. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Jim. And Jim, it's a little bit long of a question, so I'm happy to read it out. Or you can also unmute yourself and ask it yourself. Would you like to ask the question to the panelists? Uh, sure, this is Jim. If you're talking about this question about the Humboldt versus the California situation. So the, the Peruvian area is roughly the same primary productivity, as I understand, as California, yet the Anchoveta, which is Angrolis, I've forgotten the Angrolis species it is, the Anchoveta off Peru is roughly three times as productive in terms of the fishery as we have off the California current. And yet there's already been a lot of habitat compression off of Peru which might be the situation for the future off California. I'm wondering when we see habitat compression in these models, does that mean that the population loses that much, whatever is lost and you're below a uh, habitable depth, you no longer have that in production or does that production move to shallower waters? And how does that play out both in the models and presumably that'll tell us, be informative about the future. I may have confused it more than then clarified my question. That sounds like a, a question meant for me. Um, and it's a good one. Thank you. I think we don't really know how changes in habitat uh, relate to changes in abundance in a very um, general way. Um, I think, you know, the results I showed suggest that um, because there was a strong correlation between abundance, at least larval abundance, and the habitat volume, there are mechanisms that translate from one to the other. But I don't think we really know how those work. Um, obviously, as the habitat is eroded, it's, that happens from the bottom uh, because it's primarily driven by oxygen, and that compresses you know, the populations into uh, shallower water, you know, where, um, you know, changes their feeding opportunities and predation and all kinds of things. You know, how all of those impacts of being compressed into a shorter water column, more well-lit water column, um, actually, you know, work through the whole demographics of the population is, is still something that needs to be worked out, I would say. We just have the correlation that uh, that habitat volume relates strongly to abundance. Yeah, well, thanks. That answers it in part. I remember that graph that you put up showing that. It's just a, a bit of a conundrum wondering how you have such a productive fishery that's so compressed. And I, I think it's difficult to shift from an understanding of the Peruvian anchovy fishery to what might happen in the future off California. And you've all, your, the modeling helps a lot in posing questions that may um, help us direct monitoring research and modeling to do, to address that. I know Checkley's review in, uh, of the anchovy fishery suggests that it's differences in nitrate inputs that are, that are driving those differences, but that may be insufficient to explain these patterns in the future. I'm not sure. Thanks for your answer. Sure. I also put a, a typed answer in, in there uh, 
with a different interpretation of your question. So if you want to follow that up. I did see that. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And Francis Chan, I will also turn it over to you from the task force. You had a question in the chat box. Did you want to pose that to the group? Uh, actually, I can, I'd like to use, maybe just use my time to ask a, a different question. And maybe yep, go for it. This may be the Curtis, but <clears throat> as we think about how, we're, how well, how, how should we best invest in monitoring to track and detect changes, um, you know, is, is there a risk of doing it without basically modeling first? Because can you, for example, interrogate your model to ask, if we randomly put, you know, monitoring stations, are, are there some that will not tell us any, anything meaningful about changes over the decades for the couple of biological and biogeochemical changes? You know, and can your models really identify hotspots where we think the changes will be sharpest so that we would see the, the biggest changes in DO or Aragonite saturation state and uh, uh, biological uh, distributions. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at the at the scale of the entire California current, the the changes um, are you know, in in the models that I showed, which were you know twelve kilometer resolution. So eddy, eddy resolving, but not at the level that Jim was showing. At that level, there, the changes are fairly broad scale on average. Um, but of course, you know, if you take a snapshot at any given moment, there are places that are uh, more extreme. Um, I think Jim's slide showing the uh, variability in the in the one kilometer um, solutions showed a lot of topographic association between extremity of ch to the extremity of change um in terms of sampling you know i i think my understanding is that the practice of NOAA surveys is to collect uh more env environmental information when they're doing the the trawls and and counting um and maybe in some in some cases you know uh age and size structure as well, having, having that data um, more routine and more systematic and uh, more uh, heavily quality controlled so that, you know, drift and oxygen sensors, for example, are well calibrated and that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, process, post-process in a way that, you know, all of the observations are, um, put into common on a common uh, format and grid those those kinds of sampling issues would I think greatly uh, streamline the the process that modeling goes through it's not a, it's that's not a question an answer about changing what's observed but how the I guess how the data is is handled and and how much effort is put into the environmental sampling being of a climate precision and accuracy. Thanks, Curtis. Thank you. Now we're gonna take another question from the public. This one's from Stephanie Yeager. Thank you for this update. A question for Chris Saw. Blooms and chlorophyll A biomass are a known challenge to reproduce dynamically in models. Does the concentration of total dissolved inorganic nitrogen in the photic zone change substantially between model scenarios? What are key data gaps or information that you think could help to better validate the results between model scenarios? And that's for Faisal. Yeah, okay. So uh, I confirmed that the uh, balance of the, the uh, inorganic nitrogen is totally different when we consider the anthropogenic runs. So, um, the, uh, you know, we have an excess of ammonia because it's very, in particular during winter when the mixing just brings nutrient, deep nutrients to the surface. Uh, it also includes the uh, nitrate that is uh, in the original uh, that, that is coming first by upwelling and second because of the, the the injection from rivers and from outfalls. So we have a general increase of uh, inorganic nitrogen uh, at the surface. And the gaps, in my sense, there are mostly two. Maybe other my collaborators can also speak about that. 
Uh, the first one is that the plume dispersion happens in a uh, very, uh, very small scale. It happens in scale of few uh, tens of meters. So this is very complicated to observe. Uh, and the second one is uh, what Jim was talking about, the process study, the rates, notification, uh, estimation of notification is, uh, you know, notification happens, for instance, for when you talk about the plume, uh, the, 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 the outfalls, it happens at very local scale. When the nutrients are transformed, they are mixed. So uh, estimation of the real notification at the, at, at the depth, at the location of the plume is also another gap that is uh, very hard to validate. Thank you, I hope that answers your question. Next, we have a question from Richard Feely uh, from PMEL. He had to hop offline, but I'm gonna ask it for him. Uh, so I think this is open to all panelists. How do you plan to integrate biological thresholds into the model so that we can identify bio biological hotspots in refugia? Where do we go from here? Anyone wanna take a stab at that question? I'll, I'll talk to it first and, and the others may expand. The present approach we're taking is that we have at the plankton ecosystem level not put in thresholds. Um, rather as thresholds are something that we identify in diagnostic analyses after the fact. And, and of course, if we're talking about higher, higher trophic levels, then they're not even in the model at all. Um, they certainly can be included um, if one takes them seriously enough to, to, to test. Um, the issue of hotspots and refugia, we spoke to a moment ago, that is we're currently trying to look in the more detailed high resolution solutions for the, 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 the geographical variability. Um, and of course that has implications for um, refugia um, and, and such. So where do we go from here? I think we just keep going in, in sort of the general directions we're, we're on. Great, thank you, Jim. Anyone else want to jump in there? Uh, yes, this is Martha Satula. So um, I think it's probably worthwhile acknowledging that OPC, as well as even some of the NOAA work that, that Curtis had mentioned at the end of his, um, his presentation, is basically um, they're funding efforts to bring along um, biological tools that can help us understand the impact of these changing chemical conditions in the ocean to, you know, how that may be limiting um, potential habitat. And so I see that, um, and you can, you know, begin to see some of this work emerge. You, see, you saw reflections of it in Faisal's talk, and you certainly saw a good chunk of um, Curtis's talk speak to how we can be applying um, some of these biological interpretation tools um, with model output to be able to use them to start to have conversations, whether that's the thinking about marine vulnerability, <clears throat> excuse me, or, 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 or uh, under climate change, or how this could be used for um, supporting conversations on local, um, the impact of local pollution um, or local anthropogenic inputs. Um, so I, I think the opportunity is there for us to um, really start working together with the biologists to understand what's the best way to employ these tools. That, those are conversations we've already been trying to initiate sort of up and down the coast. And I would look forward to more of the same, you know, with, um, with you, Jack, and your group, as well as uh, other scientists are, who are interested in, in engaging on this topic. Great. Thank you, Martha. We have a couple questions from Lisa Levin. I think they were answered in the chat box by some of the other panelists, but Lisa, I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask a question verbally if you'd like. Otherwise, I'm happy to pose one of your questions. You'd have to unmute yourself, not to put you on the spot. Okay, I have to see if I can find them. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think this question will be of interest to the audience. So I'll ask it again, even though Curtis already answered it and it was for Curtis. And, and the question has to do with, um, since low oxygen waters also have low pH and low omega, um, can we distinguish anchovy responses uh, 
between oxygen and ocean acidification and how might we build ocean acidification into the metabolic index? Yeah, so I think if we had nothing to go on but just statistical correlation in field data, we would not be able to distinguish um, because the changes in pH and oxygen are so uh, tightly correlated. But the physiological data um, helps a lot here. And what it shows, although it's much stronger on the oxygen side than on the pH side, um, is that the effect of carbon system changes, pH or PCO2, on the components that make up the metabolic index are much smaller than the changes in oxygen. That is, uh, that the change in metabolic rate uh, or critical oxygen pressure um, from a change in temperature or a change in oxygen is, is far greater than for uh, a change in, in pH or PCO2. Now that's a statement that is um, based on a relatively large number of, of observations for oxygen and temperature and a relatively small number, like a handful for uh, pH and PCO2. So it may not be uh, entirely general, but for the species where they have been measured, you know, both CO2 and temperature effects on, um, on P crit, the, the temperature effect is, is far greater. So I think more laboratory work needs to be done and, and people are doing it. Um, but for now it's, and, and, and when that work is, comes to fruition, the metabolic index is capable of uh, being extended. It's a simple extension to include the, the CO2 effects on, uh, on P crit or metabolic rate. Um, but until we see something that shows a very strong effect, um, we'll, we'll be waiting for more laboratory studies. Thank you for that response. We have about 10 minutes left and a few unanswered questions still. So I'm gonna ask another one from Andrew Leasing. Although there has been a lot of discussion of model validation, a step that seems to be missing here is model sensitivity analyses, specifically with concerns to the BEC component. This is a really key step for determining how robust a model is to its assumptions. None of the currently available papers has any sensitivity analysis, nor do the papers that form the backbone of the BEC. From here, um, or let's see, of even more particular worry given your application on anthropogenic input would be the use of a quadratic zooplankton closure term and associated coefficients, since this term will actually set the level at which nutrient supply either does or does not lead to a phytoplankton bloom, documented in numerous papers by Ewell and Edwards et al. I think this would be for Jim and or Faisal, I believe. Or um, yeah, also I'll, I'll pose this to Jim or other panelists that want to speak to this? Well, I mean, I'm happy to talk about the first part. Um, the okay. sensitivity. Yes, go for it. I, yeah, I wanted to talk about the first part. Jim, you go. <laughs> the second part is, is a harder question for me, and I'll, I'll let Curtis and, and Daniele speak to it. I mean, this is a very good generic question about the methodology of modeling in making models of this type and in coaxing them towards um, looking like nature as best we can judge it, a great deal of sensitivity work is done. Um, but by sort of the conventions of, of the culture, um, the excruciating details of daily life are, are not recorded in, in, in the written papers. Um, it could of course be done in a more systematic and publishable way. Um, that's labor, you know, we're a finite number of people. Um, key questions when they arise can be looked at. More generally, I think this is something that a community addresses um, and model sensitivity is an enormous subject in global climate and, 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 and earth system modeling. And that includes a great deal of published work on BEC and its, its sensitivities because essentially the same model is being used by the um, in your system modeling community, the same model is being used by uh, Nikki Gruber in Zurich and his group. 
Um, but it is definitely a challenge for, for us going forward to, to try to expand the scope of, of model sensitivities. I think those of us who do it know a great deal about the sensitivities. They are certainly non-trivial, but they, for the most part, for the things we're talking about, are not categorical. That is, you, you don't turn global warming into global cooling, and, and you don't turn stimulated productivity in, into starvation. Now, someone else should speak to the quadratic zooplankton closure term. Well, I would just add maybe a, a bit more anecdotally that, um, you know, this is the stuff that we don't put in the paper, as Jim said. You know, when we first started this, we had pretty significant biases in the um, model's representation of net primary productivity. And at that point, we did undertake a lot of um, hypothesis-driven sensitivity experiments to find which parameters were keeping Northern California current productivity lower than it appears to be from satellites. Um, and none of them could resolve that bias. So we looked at, for example, the um, zooplankton grazing. We didn't look specifically at quadratic closure on the zooplankton population, but we looked at a whole bunch of things. Um, none of them could, could erase that bias. Eventually we found that um, the, the paper by Kristen Davis and Parker McCready looking at nutrient inputs through mixing in the Juan de Fuca uh, Strait and, and Canyon. Um, and that did the trick almost instantly. Um, and I could tell you a similar, similar story about iron, playing with the iron uh, physiological parameters didn't change the representation of iron distribution or iron limitation um, nearly as much as um, coming up with a better empirical formulation of the benthic iron efflux based on, on uh, uh, lander data. So those two experiences, um, as well as others, including the uh, refinement of atmospheric forcing fields, um, basically taught me that the sensitivity studies are uh, excruciating, I think, as Jim said. They're um, almost impossible to do systematically because of the number of parameters involved. And they tend to pale in their um, impact to the kind of boundary condition and other um, um, sort of st structural choices that go into um, mo uh, the model and ensuring its fidelity. So I think it's it, it would be a, a great thing to do in a high resolution simulation like this. It will be a very painful thing to do. And I, I hope that someone takes on that pain at some point. Um, but I, but um, yeah, so there's, there's adding th thoughts to Jim and maybe someone else wants to comment on the zooplankton closure term. Well, I can, I can uh, comment a little bit as well. Um, the zooplankton representation in the model is probably at the limit of what, what the model is designed to do. It's, uh, Curtis referred that as a closure term. Uh, so it's, it's meant to represent a sort of umbrella single zooplanktonic mortality term on phytoplankton. The quadratic assumption is a very common one uh, that I've seen in many other uh, models. Uh, as a context, the DEC model has, has a history of about 20 years and is used by NCAR and is part of the uh, IPCC class, uh, one of the two US models used for IPCC projection. Um, this model with this quadratic mortality, in fact, represents phytoplankton blooms from the North Atlantic to you know, oligotrophic condition in the Pacific. So it's an assumption that in some way can, can give realistic global representation of, of phytoplankton cycles. Um, I would say it's also a philosophically <laughs> sound assumption when you don't want to resolve the entire zooplankton or multiple groups or, or the predators of zooplankton. It basically assumes that mortality, the predators are proportional to how much zooplankton is in the water and that gives you a sort of quadratic or density dependent mortality term. It's also sometimes used as a trick to stabilize a little bit the food web. And I think it, it definitely is one of the parameters that you know, has been tuned and, and maybe the tuning of the parameter has been buried in some paper or uh, lost in some paper. 
uh, and that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, <laughs> I did not do this during myself, so I cannot comment much on, on how sensitive the parameter, uh, this specific parameter is. Uh, but I, I want also to add that um, we are engaged in extending the models toward the um, higher trophic levels. And so zooplankton is something we are starting to look uh, much more carefully. Uh, it turns out that we, the biomass of zooplankton uh, represented by the model is uh, exactly on top of observations. Uh, so that's an encouraging thing. Uh, what we miss is uh, the gradients of um, uh, coastal gradient are not as uh, sharp as they are in observation. So there is a lot of work that uh, uh, we are doing and probably we're gonna open up this uh, simple representation in future iterations. Great, thank you. We have two minutes left and two more questions. One's from Kristen Fogerin. The BEC model is new to me. I was wondering if it is including a benthic component and is the model available anywhere? So where can people access this information? Um, Any of our so panelists? Uh, yes, go ahead. The, the, there is no benthic component of the ecosystem. There are benthic components of the chemical fluxes that um, that drive the uh, pelagic ecosystem, so iron and nitrogen fluxes um, and oxygen. Um, the code is uh, will be published when these review in, in conjunction with these two review papers. There is another living version of the code that is maintained by the uh, by NCAR as part of the community earth system model. Um, and that can be downloaded uh, directly from the internet. Great, thank you. And this last question is for Jim it's from Paul Smith. Jim, for the near shore wave effects, will the Will there be any utility in comparing your model output with the CDIP model output points since those downscale WW3 and assimilate wave buoy data? Or assimilate? Yeah, I'll pose that to you, Jim. CDIP is, is certainly one of the major operations in, in wave modeling, particularly relative in your shore and in California. There's a whole community that sort of relates the, the Wave Watch 3 operational wave model to that data, including the assimilations. This is part of the, the data products for surface waves, and, and one can use you know, the, the data sets of choice or, or the model coupling of choice to try to explore the interaction of currents and waves. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. So with that, I think that's all of our questions. I wanted to thank everyone for listening in today. Thank you to our presenters for your time and your wonderful presentations. Thanks to the Ocean Protection Council for providing funding for this webinar series. I'm going to circulate the webinar recording and post the presentations on the OEH Science Task Force website, www.westcoastoeh.org. Again, I want to send my condolences to those affected by the Conception Dive Boat Fire in Southern California. It's a very small ocean community and our hearts go out to everyone. And with that, on behalf of the OAH Science Task Force, Ocean Protection Council, and Ocean Science Trust, we're going to sign off. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your time, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Haley. Bye.